Today on Duck Conta Chemistry, we'll be talking about MSDS, or Material Safety Data Sheets. What are they good for? Absolutely everything! And hopefully by the end of this lesson, you'll be able to identify any of the chemical characteristics using an MSDS. <laughs> Timeline for today is what are these material safety data sheets, what do they contain, and what information is in each section within an MSDS. And secondly, we're going to look up some specific chemicals in an MSDS to show you the actual application of using one. So material safety data sheets, or MSDS, just as they imply, are sheets of data that contain information about a specific chemical of interest that you're looking into we're going to walk through the MSDS for bleach. This example will hopefully help you find any kind of other pertinent information about any other chemical you may be interested in. A simple Google search or Bing search or whatever kind of search you use for MSDS for blank, whether that be MSDS for corn syrup, MSDS for alcohol, MSDS for whatever you're interested in, will take you to the chemical you desire and all of the information that we have on that chemical in terms of its safety. So here in section one for bleach of the MSDS, we can see the product name, its chemical name, we can see any other names it's known by, the chemical formula, and the NFPA label. If you don't know what an NFPA label is, please check out my linked video and learn a little bit about what that little diamond that's blue, red, yellow, and white stands for and what each of those quadrants means for easy identification of a chemical safety. On this section one, you can see that bleach, as we know it, is known as sodium hypochlorite 5%. So this information is pertaining to bleach and its specific name or its product name is sodium hypochlorite 5% thereof. And we can see that there's synonyms for sodium hypochlorite 5%. You can see it's called chlorine bleach, bleach, soda bleach, Clorox, sodium hypochlorite, solution of 5% available chlorine. These are all basically implying the same chemical. They're all the same thing. The chemical name, so it's really specific chemical name, is the hypochlorous acid sodium salt solution. This particular MSDS sheet was acquired from sciencelab.com. It's not my own, but if you're looking for other MSDS sheets, I also recommend Fisher Scientific or any of the more name brand kind of laboratories out there in terms of credibility for the information you're looking for. Section two of our MSDS for bleach will show us our composition and information on the ingredients of that chemical. So for bleach in specific, we can see in section two that it is four to 7% by weight sodium hypochlorite and less than 1% by weight sodium hydroxide and greater than 92% by weight of water. In section three of bleach, we can see that it lists all of the hazards, the hazards identification. So it's gonna tell us that it's uh, very hazardous in the case of skin contact, which you would personally know if you ever get bleach on your hands. It's a pretty huge irritant for your skin. It'll dry, crack it out, make it burn. And your eye contact, it will also irritate your eyes pretty horribly. Even just smelling bleach kind of irritates your eyes. And of course, if you were to ingest it, it is uh, definitely not recommended to ingest bleach. Even in COVID times, people like don't drink bleach, please. Now you'll also see that it's listed the hazards in terms of potential acute health effects and potential chronic health effects. So things that are, you know, acute meaning not like, oh, that's a really cute eye burn you've got there. No, it could still hurt you pretty bad, but these are kind of like the acute health effects and then chronic being like, would it give you cancer? So what we also see about bleach here in section three is that it is slightly hazardous in terms of inhaling it. For me personally, I can't stand the smell of bleach. It'll just burn my throat like crazy in my lungs. So it's different for each person too, but we do see that it's non-corrosive for lungs overall. However, we do see that a liquid or the spray or the smell thereof could cause tissue damage to your eyes, to your mouth, and to your mucous membrane and your respiratory tract. Some of the potential chronic health effects are carcinogenic or cancer causing, and you can see in the definition there, it's classified as a three for that cancer causing effect. Mutagenic 
means that it causes mutation. So it changes your DNA, it mutates your DNA. In this case, it says, hey, it's mutagenic for bacteria and or yeast, which is what we would hope bleach would do since we use it to sterilize surfaces. We want it to kill bacteria. That's what it's really good at. We also see that it's mutagenic for mammalian, meaning creatures that have mammary glands, i.e. creatures that have nipples and can lactate to feed their young. Somatic, meaning body, soma means body, body cells. So mutagenic causes mutations in the DNA for mammals, i.e. us, cats, dogs, whales, um, for their body cells. Teratogenic, that's a weird word. That means malformation of an embryo or a developing baby. We see that it is not available for the teratogenic effects. And the other thing it's not available for is for developmental toxicity. Then they basically tell us a few other things that could hurt us about it in chronic or prolonged exposure to bleach. Let's move on to section four. This is first aid measures for this chemical. If you were to come in contact with bleach, what should you do? This is kind of telling you, hey, first things first, if you get it in your eyeballs, which you never should because you should be wearing goggles if you're working with any kind of chemical, including bleach, yes, it's a household chemical. Yes, it can still hurt you really bad. So wear goggles, even at home. I wear goggles when I cook onions, people. Have a pair of goggles in your kitchen. It's important. If you get it in your eyes and you happen to wear contact lenses, make sure you remove the contact lenses. It tells you, hey, if you get it on your skin, flush your skin for 15 minutes to make sure all the chemical comes off. And if you decide to jump into a pool of it and have some serious skin contact issues, make sure you use disinfectant soap. If you inhale it, move to fresh air so that you can breathe again. And if you were to ingest it, do not induce vomiting unless directed to do so by medical personnel. Although MSDS is a great way to check what you should do if you or a loved one were to ingest some kind of chemical, my first recommendation is to call the poison control center for your area because they can tell you immediately whether or not you need to rush that person to the hospital or what you should do in terms of inducing vomiting or not inducing vomiting or if there's something else that you can eat to lessen the effect of whatever was just ingested. I kind of lumped sections five through eight for bleach here all together because I don't feel that they are necessarily the most important of the sections for your day-to-day -day activities or your day-to-day -day measures for the average human being in terms of interesting things for chemicals. But section five goes over the fire and explosion data. Basically, is it flammable? Will it auto ignite? What are its flash points, its flammable limits? What are other things that it would react with in terms of making it flammable? Things like that. Section six is accidental release measures. So if you were to spill it somewhere outside, inside, what do you do? How do you clean it up? Section seven is handling and storage. So if you are a chemical laboratory, for example, how are you going to store it? What do you put it near? Can you keep it safely near some chemicals and away from others? And how do you handle it? Do you have to be wearing a special kind of gloves or bodysuit? Do you have to put it in a special rubber container to transport it from point A to point B? Exposure controls and personal protection. So what's the limit of how much you should be exposed to this chemical? Basically, it states you should be always wearing goggles when you handle any kind of chemical really ever and any other personal protection you should be aware of when handling this chemical. Section nine, in my opinion, is probably one of the most applicable uh, to your day to day life and interests of a chemical. So section nine for bleach is showing the physical and chemical properties of bleach. This is the section that will basically tell you the personality of a chemical. Basically anything you want to know about the chemical in terms of its mass, its color, uh, its, its appearance, does it exist in a liquid, solid, or gas state? What does it smell like? When does it melt? When does it boil? What's its density? Is it volatile? Will it dissolve in water? And many other things. Specific gravity or density, as it's more commonly referred to as in our everyday language, is something I will be demonstrating in my next video, so be sure to watch out for that in terms of specific gravity density using MSDS and applying that to the chemicals in real life. So what does boiling point and melting point have to do with the chemical? The boiling point is the temperature at which that chemical will boil. Each chemical has a different boiling point. And the melting point 
is the temperature at which that chemical will melt or begin to melt. Notice that they even have funny things in this physical characteristic like taste. What does it taste like? The acids will almost nearly always taste sour, and if there's something that's a base chemical, it will nearly always taste bitter. But obviously, we're not just going around tasting every chemical under the sun because that would be really dangerous, but back in the old days, they actually did taste chemicals, which is how we know that acids are sour and bases are bitter, along with acidic and basic food. Section 11. Wait a second, Mrs. DeConto, we're section 10, are you nuts? We'll come back to section 10 in a second. Hold your horses, don't worry, but we're gonna skip to section 11 right now for just this second. Section 11 for bleach talks about the toxicological information. Yeah, if you didn't catch that, that was toxicological information from section 11. This section is very similar to our hazards identification section and basically tells you what's going to happen for a, quote, victim if they come in contact with this chemical. So the special remarks, which I've outlined in red, kind of show you that, hey, this can cause severe irritation, possible burn to skin and eyes. Eye contact may also cause corneal and conjunctival edema. Ugh, and hemorrhages. Ugh. Contact with skin may cause vesicular eruptions. Yike! Those are big words and they sound scary. Prolonged or repeated eye contact may cause conjunctivitis. Ingestion can cause burns to digestive tract. And then this is where it spells out the symptoms of what's happening for this person that's come in contact with the chemical. One, pain and inflammation of the mouth, pharynx, esophagus, and stomach. Two, erosion of the mucous membranes, chiefly of the stomach. Nausea, vomiting, choking, coughing, hemorrhaging, just another Tuesday. Three, circulatory collapse with cold and clammy skin. Four, confusion, delirium, coma. Five, Edema of the pharynx, glottis, larynx. Six, preparation of the esophagus, and so on, and so forth, of all the horrible things that can happen to you if you were to come in contact with bleach. All right, back to section 10, as I promised. Section 10 is the stability and reactivity. I've kind of lumped these all together as well because I feel like these sections are not as interesting as the other sections and not used on a day-to-day -day basis for the average human and when they're interested for chemicals and so on and so forth. So for section 10, we're talking about stability. Is it stable or not? It says the product is stable, cool. But then it also tells you, hey, what are conditions that would make it instable? So it's telling you, hey, it's incompatible with light, air, and heat. So keep your Clorox bottle tightly closed and away from heat sources. It also tells you the corrosivity. So it'll tell you what you should specifically keep it away from. And it says here it's extremely corrosive in the presence of aluminum. So keep it away from your tinfoil, your aluminum. It also says it's corrosive to stainless steel. So maybe don't wipe down your stainless steel fridge and oven and appliances with bleach. In the special remarks on reactivity, it also goes over some things that will decompose the chemical. In this case, it's saying, hey, it's gonna slowly decompose with air if you leave it open. Meaning that it won't be sodium hypochloride anymore if you keep it open for a really long time because it's reacting with the air and then you're not gonna have bleach that's actually bleach anymore, and it won't sanitize your surface. Hence, keep your bottle of bleach securely locked. Section 12 through 16. Section 12 is ecological information, so what will this do to the environment? Section 13, disposal considerations. How should you dispose of any used chemical or anything of that sort? Section 14, transport information. If you needed to take this chemical on a road trip, how should you be transporting it from point A to point B? Section 15, other regulatory information, and section 16, other information in general. So if there's anything additionally that you'd really like to know about a chemical other than its specific gravity, color, taste, odor, all those other things, check out the sections 15 and 16. So let's give it a whirl in real life and do a Google search or again a Bing search or a DuckDuckGo search or whatever it is that you like to do kind of search for the following items. So we'd like to look up the MSDS for rubbing alcohol and we want to find specific gravity. So this is like a treasure hunt. I want you to look for the specific gravity number, the value associated with rubbing alcohol in the MSDS. Also look up the MSDS for water and find its specific gravity, i.e. its density. And last but not least, look up the MSDS for corn syrup and find its specific gravity value. Let's give it a go and find these three chemicals in an MSDS. 
quick little useful tip here for those of you that don't know this little trick that'll help you get through high school and college and the rest of your life in the digital age is to use control find on your keyboard. So if you're scouring a PDF or a document for a specific phrase or word, you can type in or press and hold control F, control find, that's what the F is for in this situation, control F. And then a little search box will appear in the upper right hand corner of your screen where you can type in a word like specific gravity and it'll take you to that word in the document instead of having to scroll for like 20 pages to try and find that word. If you have a Mac, you would use command F for the same exact function. Let's give it a try. So the first one we're going to look up is the MSDS for rubbing alcohol. I'm going to pick the Fisher Scientific one and I'm going to press and hold control on my keyboard and press and hold the F key at the same time. There's my little search bar. Now I type in specific and I'm looking for specific gravity. Notice it highlights that word for me right there and it also tells me, hey, that's the density by the way. The density value is 0.7850. We'll come back to that in the next video and what we're going to use that for. Let's try our next chemical. So we have the specific gravity or the density 0 0.7850 of rubbing alcohol. That's its density. Now let's look up MSDS for water. We've got Fisher Scientific right there at the top. We've also got Lab Chem. Both are totally fine to use, but I'm still going to just go with Fisher Scientific. We're going to press and hold Control F or Command F if you're using a Mac, and we're looking for the word specific again. Specific gravity density is 1. 1. 1.0000. 1. So the density of water is 1. That's its numerical value. Last but not least, let's look up the MSDS for the corn syrup. So we can make sure the product name does say corn syrup. It is the right MSDS that we're looking for. We'll do control F or command F to find specific. Now in this document, when I type in specific, notice it says specific toxic chemical listings and specific toxic chemical listings twice. There's no specific gravity, but we know that specific gravity is synonymous with the word density. So let's look for density. There's vapor density. That's not what we want. We don't want vapor in the gas form. We want the actual density, the relative density. That's right here. And that's a value of 1.54. So we've discovered that the rubbing alcohol density is 0 0.7850. The water density is one and corn syrup's density is 1.54. Very cool. All from using an MSDS. And again, we're going to apply these values in our next video with some cool chemical experiments. So click on the next video to see what we do with those density values. Hopefully you should be able to use an MSDS now to find pertinent information on any chemical your heart desires. You should be able to know where to find the chemical's name in section one, the hazards of that chemical or the toxicological information of that chemical, and the chemical and physical properties of that chemical. Of all the sections we've talked about, sections 1, 11, and 9 are very important sections in any MSDS. Now if you're super brave, go find a chemical that you use often in your home, whether for cleaning or eating. Yes, caro syrup, like corn syrup, is still a chemical and you do eat it. So if there's something that you eat often or you have a chemical you use often in your home, check it out in a material safety data sheet and let me know what you find about that chemical in the comments below. Have a quacky day. No ducks, no glory.